television highlights of the news of yesteryear. of the Salvation Army. These Army members you are watching are the outgrowth of the ideals and beliefs of one man, William Booth, who in 1865 began the evangelical organization whose principal precept is God is love. Wars, disasters, and civic disintegration find the Army on hand to help. Personal tribute to Booth, who stepped out of the pulpit of East London in 1865 to start this now international organization. In 1879, the Army held its first meeting in America, with Philadelphia the site and Lieutenant Eliza Shirley in charge. 1904 saw command passing to Evangeline Booth, shown here in Boston receiving an award for valor. Fourth daughter of the Army's founder, Evangeline Booth retired in 1934, but her teachings and her followers carried on in World War II, the example she had set in the First World War. The Salvation Army, which had started in England, sent its American members back to Britain to aid after the Blitz raids. An army that fought without guns, it helped win a victory by bolstering morale, providing for civilians and soldiers alike the all-important diversion London needed to bear up under the Blitz. The crusade of one man, William Booth, begun 80 years before, reached its climax in World War II. 97 countries and colonies are represented in the Salvation Army, the members of which have dedicated themselves to the spiritual, moral, and physical reformation of the needy. Particularly active in emergencies such as shown here, the Army by no means restricts its work to welfare. True it is that Army workers were on the battle scene with their ever-present donuts and coffee, but in civilian life too, the Army is active. Particularly pointed in its peacetime plans is the defeat of juvenile delinquency. The problem that besets communities in the United States is being tackled by and partially solved through a series of Salvation Army social activities. Recreation rooms for youngsters are being opened and supervised. Planned programs are endeavoring to keep American youth off the streets and out of trouble. The Army is again fighting a battle, and judging from these youngsters is winning it. In New York in 1946, 12 years after her retirement, Evangeline Booth is honored by Variety Club members from all over the country. Here, Barker O'Donnell presents Miss Booth with the Humanitarian Award. Booth speaks. I am so fully conscious of the honor that has been conferred upon me by the supremacy of the vote that has made me the recipient of the humanitarian award. Your loving goodwill toward me has made me want to do more and be more. I can already see the points of the setting sun, but yet there is time. I must do more and be more for the greater good of all men. When the night is darkest for unfortunates, when hope is a forgotten memento of the past, the Salvation Army carries on its campaigns in every city of the country, a constant reminder that somebody cares, that solace, understanding, and companionship are always available at the Salvation Army. Nineteen thirty-three, and first and only visit to America is made by novelist Joseph Conrad. Born in Poland, Conrad wrote adventure novels like Lord Jim, Typhoon, Victory, and The Arrow of Gold. We're in New York City to watch Osa Johnson, famous explorer and widow of Martin Johnson, with whom she made many expeditions, show some of the animals she brought back from Borneo. 
The Johnsons introduced exploring by aircraft in 1932, 15 years after their first expedition to North Borneo. Prize protege of the period. It's 1925 and San Francisco thrills to nine-year-old Yehudi Manuin. Having studied violin since the age of four, the youthful genius waited until he was 10 to debut at Carnegie Hall and set America agog with his technique and tone. Nineteen thirty-three sees commission headed by Congressman Magnuson about to inspect biggest undeveloped area of the Yukon in preparation for an Alaskan international passageway to be known as the Alcan Highway. The plane is bound for picturesque but impassable British Columbia and Yukon territory to report on the practicability of the feat. Engineer Pruning and Congressman Magnuson are later to report the mountains can be traversed, the forests can be blasted to provide room for the road. Nine years later, in the spring of 1942, work begins on the Alcan. Seven regiments of army engineers and 52 civilian contractors began the huge undertaking. 14,000 men prepared to tackle the job, which is to result in a passageway overland from Dawson Creek, British Columbia, to Whitehorse, Alaska. In temperatures ranging from 35 below to 90 above, workmen hammer their way, and late in 1942, three months ahead of schedule, the Alcan Highway, built at a cost of almost $40 million, was officially open. Here are the first airplane pictures of the road, and here, the first vehicle to travel it. The Alcan Highway, passage to Alaska's oil, tungsten, and coal, gateway to its gold. January 1st, 1919, and 3,000 returning AEF veterans are imperiled only a few miles from home as the troop ship Northern Pacific runs aground at Fire Island, New York. 237 battle wounded are aboard as BN Chase, Naval Air Station Lieutenant Commander, flies to inspect the ship and plan rescue of its complement. For three days, Coast Guard stalwarts labor to bring ashore the returning combat men. Principal danger lies in possibility of the Northern Pacific sinking into the sand, a situation circumvented by removal of all on board and reporting after rescue work was completed. Coast Guard boats bring back to land soldiers taken off the ship with the Red Cross on hand to help. A tough trip, but they made it. Nineteen thirty and a record-shattering west-east trip by aviatrix Ruth Nichols. Thirteen hours, twenty-one minutes was her time. The following year, she was to set an altitude record for women of 28,743 feet. And in 1932, she was to become the first woman airline pilot in the United States. But back to 1930 again, this time in Croydon, England, as cheering crowds greet English flyer Amy Johnson, returning home after solo flight to Australia. In 1931, she used to make an historic round-trip flight from London to Tokyo. But here in 1930, she apologizes for the time it took her to get to the land down under. It is just wonderful of you all to turn out in such numbers to welcome me here. I feel I must apologize for keeping you waiting so long. I know that's a bad advert for aviation, but never mind, we're going to do better in the future. It's hair today and not gone tomorrow. We're back in the 1920s to see some unshorn cheese who shun the shears. The scene is Los Angeles and the gals have pledged to ban any bobs from a barber. Yes, ma'am, woman's crowning glory stays at the head of this class. From 
head to foot now. Remember when these shoe styles were a must for the stylishly shod lady? Two-tone saddle shoe for sports. Very durable. You couldn't wear them. Out. An afternoon sandal you could hold a candle to and be better off. Two-tone Oxford for discreet streetwear. Low heel and pointed toe. Seen enough? Then off we go to see what the well-dressed man toted on his tootsies. High style in the early 20s. What do I think of this shoe? Shoe. King size bobsledding takes over in Oyster Bay, Long Island. There are 34 riders on this speed sled when it hits its 60 mile an hour clip. There's the start. It picks up a couple of crewmen and down it goes. Traffic stops, which is a good thing because the sled can't. Yes, bobsledding's in season at Oyster Bay. A different kind of a race this time. It's the 1925 Kentucky Derby at Churchill Downs. The sun's out as the horses are called to the post, but just before they get started, look out. That's rain, friends, and it's the crowd that begins racing. Rain or no rain, there they go. Riding Flying Ebony in this 51st Derby is top jockey Earl Sandy. And he waits until the home stretch before he makes his move. That's Sandy on the outside taking over. Hats off to the Derby winners, Black Ebony and Earl Sandy. 